that I... Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. I'm very excited about today's show, and I'll tell you a little bit more in a minute. This show was nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award, and it is number under 100 of the top 100 podcasts in all of the USA in self-improvement, as well as in the top 50 in many countries. I love seeing some of the countries that come in most recently Turkey. So Turkey is in the house and last week it was the Caribbean. Terrific. And what I do out in the world is I am a media visibility authority. I help people. I coach them to write a page turner book. I also run a company that helps generate your book, once you've written it, to a guaranteed international bestseller. And finally, I run the ultimate visibility formula and I show you how you can get interviewed on radio and podcast and get massive results like selling your book, filling your workshops, finding your tribe in your community and more. If you would like to get some of my free tools and templates, including finding out what your message is, because everybody truly is a sage, go to debbie-inger.com slash message. My gift to you, it's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash message. This show has been on air for over 13 years, and I think a lot of that is due to you. So thank you for subscribing, telling your friends about the show, and giving us five-star reviews. And I love seeing your emails. Keep it up. I appreciate it, and I do read every single one. So why this is particularly close to my heart today is because it's a book. It is a book. It is an anthology. And uh, somewhere in my paperwork is actually a copy of a book that was generated by some very special people who heard a call. Let's see if we can get this up here. This is, I, I love, I love Zoom, don't you? It looks like the ghost of Christmas past. But anyway, uh, this is the cover of the book, which is the ultimate visibility formula. I can see it's, it's doing fabulous things. <laughs> but this is probably the best way you'll see it, the ultimate visibility formula. And it is a compilation. There are some amazing pers people, persons, persons of interest, who came aboard to write their story to tell something that was really important to them about a dog or dogs and whether they were dog lovers or celebrity dog trainers or service dog people. There's some pretty interesting authors here in the house today for a panel discussion. What's the name of the book? Why it is the ultimate book for dog lovers. If you're not covered in dog hair, your life is empty. You can go to Amazon to get your copy, both print and ebook. And Ultimate is spelled U L T I MUT, M U T T. So be sure to spell it correctly. So today's show connects with the amazing book authors of the Ultimate Book for Dog Lovers, such as celebrity dog trainer Ryan Matthews, the very talented Paula Anderson. She's one of the nation's top. CPR's first prose, renowned children's author, Hal. I'm so excited that Hal is here, Hal Price. Publisher, Vicki Winterton, and more. And we're gonna have an incredible panel discussion about dogs with heartwarming information you've never heard before. I wanna give a little shout out and say thank you so much to the people who sponsor this show. Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. I love their work out in the world. And if you are ready for some energy healing or you want to become a facilitat facilitator or read books or get their products online, they are worldwide in any country today. Go to Dr. Dane here. It's D-A-I-N-H-E-E-R.com as well as accessconsciousness.com. And I almost can promise you that sometime today in the show, you will hear what is definitely not background sound effects, but instead are actual dogs because we have also dogs in the house. So first and foremost, let me welcome all the amazing authors to the show of the ultimate book for dog lovers. Hi, everybody. Hi, all authors. Hello. Hi, Debbie. 
Great to see everybody here. So I want to start because I really want to give some great content to the listeners. There's so many dog lovers in the world today, which warms my heart. And I guess I want to just start with training because not everybody understands the importance of training or maybe a training tip that could change your life, your dog's life, your relationship with your dog, maybe your dog's relationship with your neighborhood. <laughs> so I want to start there. I want to bring on Ryan, if Ryan Matthews is here. And Ryan, I would like, since you are the celebrity trainer who was kind enough to write the forward to our book, talk about why is training important and also tell us a tip something you know that we couldn't possibly know as a lay person about dogs. You got it. Well, first of all, I got to tell you, Debbie, that the pleasure was really all mine. It's, it's me being of service and me sharing my gift. So I appreciate the opportunity to be involved in this project. And I think you're awesome. So anything that you're doing, I always want to be involved. So again, thank you. And you brought some incredible people on board as well. And so I've been really touched by all the various stories. It's just, Man, I got to tell you, I was crying when I was reading through the various chapters on this, just such heartfelt stories. But you had asked about a training tip and uh, you wanted something else. What was the other one? Yeah. Why is training important? Because some people are very surprised, for instance, when I say, oh, the moment I got Shelby, my dog, she's my first dog. What did I know? We both spent a year and a half in training. That was the beginning of our lives together. And I know every time someone gives me a compliment today, I know it's about the training. It set the stage. So I'd like you to talk about why is training so important? Why do people come to you for training? What do they get? And then give us a tip, a training tip we may not know. Sure. Well, what if we got rid of the word training actually and pretended that didn't even exist? And what if instead of the word training, we put in the word connecting? right? Which is kind of out there, right? But if you really, if you really chew on that, and if you think about it, in order to, to get the training results that you need, you have to form this type of connection. I mean, I'm getting the chills when I speak of this way right now, Debbie. I mean, when we connect with our animal and we speak their language and they speak ours and we understand what each other both need and want, then it's a really harmonious relationship. And so all these training tools, yes, they can matter. But if we dive into this connection and this bond, I think that if we start there, then the, the rest is fairly easy. And so when I talk about easy, here's, I'll give two tips if it's okay. So the secrets to get your dog to do what you want would be number one, to be consistent. And so that means you consistently show up as a very fair leader. You don't let your bad day interfere with how you treat your dog. You don't let... Um, your other stuff going on with your career interact interfere, should I say, with your connection and your interaction with your dog, because it, the dog will feel safe and, and comfortable and secure and wanting to follow that reliable and consistent leader. And the other one is repetition. And so we know that in going to the gym or in whatever we're trying to accomplish in life is that if we just try something one time, it likely won't work. So that when we're trying to create a new behavior in the animal, we need to repetitiously do it over and over and over again. And so if people would be consistent and follow through and mean what they say and, and, and follow through and make sure that the dog does it by providing again, guidance and leadership and also being very consistent person and repetition, they'll see great results. I love that consistency, repetition, and throughout the word training, let's focus instead on connection. That's deep because I know for myself, I strongly feel that. Uh, my dog doesn't have to, actually my dog doesn't do much. She literally will look at something and she has such utter trust. And I somehow know exactly what it is she wants and needs. And from there I do it, I execute it. And she's always very satisfied. So yeah, connection is everything connection, but you said you somehow know. I think what happens is you're likely get some, getting some kind of intuitive download from a higher power. It's almost, I call it dancing with your dog. And that's the real essence and the real magic of that relationship that really touches me when I see people reach that level. 
Dancing with Dogs. That's our new movie. We have to make <laughs> the book into a movie now. That's beautiful. And Paola, Paola and Ryan know each other. They're colleagues and friends. And so Paola also is quite considerable out into the world, working with dogs, has put her heart and her life on the line. Paola, I want to welcome you to Dare to Dream. And would you also answer that question, why training or connecting is important? And if you could offer a tip that we might be able to use with our dogs. Yes, Debbie, thank you so much for having me. Um, well, training is important in so many ways, but just like Ryan said, it's more about connecting with your dog, um, connecting with your pet or our furry kids as we call them now. Um, I am all about having an actionable care plan for our pets. If we know where we are at with our pets, if we know where their health is at, if we have a plan uh, and we can connect not only with our pets, but with our pet professionals that help us take care of our pets, then they, we can reach that goal that we all have as pet parents, which is how can I help my pet live longer? How can I have my pet live longer, but with a good quality of life, happy, free of diseases and free of any dangers? And that is where training and connection comes in you know when we know where our pets are or, um, where our pets are at all times um, what our pets behaviors are in different situations on the street whether we're walking at a friend's house we can take care of them better they can live a better life with us and we can live a better life with them and um, thank you so care which is great because for all of us, longevity with our beloved fur child is everything. We want them to stay around forever if we're not gonna clone them. And I know a lot of people talk about that. So again, the connection and then the care so we can create longevity and health, know where they are, understand what they want and need and what is healthy for our particular pet, which is very interesting because also with breeds, a lot of different breeds necessitate different things, right? That is correct. Breeds have different necessities when it comes to food, you know, what we feed them, nutrition, um, grooming, how often they need their grooming, brushing, et cetera. How, when it comes to teeth, different breeds have different diseases that come up at different ages. So we just need to be aware of all that. So connecting, like Ryan says, with our pets is very important so we can help them. Indeed. My Shelby, the dog, is a cockapoo. So she, that means she's a cocker spaniel poodle. And so she has cocker spaniel ears. And one thing I learned very early on is I can't get water in her ears. So because her ears are not up like Ryan's dog, <laughs> um, more like a German shepherd, her ears flop over. It means that if water gets stuck in the ears, bacteria is created so she can get ear infections. So that's just one example of something I have to be very careful of. And let's bring Michael Berkey, who runs Michigan Dog Training on the show. Michael, welcome to Dare to Dream. And I pose the same question to you. Why training? Why is it important? And what do you offer to your clients that you might illuminate us and we can use? Thank you, Debbie. Um, we really want to enhance the human and dog relationships. And as Ryan was talking about connection, that's really what everybody wants. We want the dog to be able to grow up as a family member. Um, and so uh, teaching the dog good manners, just like we would with our children is really important, but even more important is the connection. And for me, uh, I work with a lot of dogs that have fear issues, aggressive issues, um, and a way to build trust with the dog, especially a dog I don't know, is inviting them into my circle um, instead of me imposing myself onto them. Uh, it's sort of like when I used to be a canine officer, uh, if I was going to approach someone on the side of the road outside their car, I would encourage them, come over here, let's talk, you know, tell me what's going on for you. And rather than me imposing myself on them, I would get them to move just a few feet towards me to invite them into my circle that, yes, I control it, but it's an invitation. Um, I'm inviting them uh, to my circle and trying to understand them. And I think that's what we should be doing with our dogs. 
Mm, that's really interesting, right? It's not just my world, it's now our world. That means two right. worlds coming together. Exactly. Very, yeah, really good tip. And um, I'm gonna make sure at the end, I'm sure people are gonna be very interested in some of these people that we have on and maybe wanting to connect further. I wanna move a little bit into communication because we also have some dog communication experts here. And uh, I just wanna say at the outset that there's two people here and I realized coming into the show today, this is really meaningful. My dog is now five. And when I brought her home, she came from a rescue adoption situation, but she was born a puppy. Um, they're all born puppies. But what I mean is she came to me after her birth. And so when she came, I immediately took her into my world. And the very first weekend, maybe even the first day I had Shelby who fit in the palm of my hand, I took her to a book event that I was attending. Uh, it was a very beautiful hotel at LAX. It was being run by the person who puts, puts on the event every year. Now she does it in Mexico, but this was Vicki Winterton, a longtime friend and colleague of mine. And of course, you know, she does everything to the nines. So there was a red carpet. There was a woman, Siddiqui Sol Ray, who was taking photographs. And there was my baby puppy walking the red carpet. And I knew she was invited because Vicky's at that time, baby puppy, Ippy was there as well. So Shelby was welcome. And why it's meaningful is because also at that event is one of our authors, Hal Price. And Hal, who didn't have a dog at the time, I have photos of him with little baby Shelby on his shoulder and with Vicky and at her events. So they literally knew her from the first, first moment I knew her. And so this is such an incredible full circle these almost five years later that we are all here together with this book, the ultimate book for dog lovers. It's pretty meaningful. So I just wanted to put that out there. And then I want to bring on the, for me, very genius, Vicki Winterton. And Vicki, you've worked with dogs before. You've had quite a life with dogs owning as well as working with. So I would love for you to talk about communication. And if you have any tips about how you work with your EP or any other dogs you've had throughout your life that we may not know that we can implement. Well, thank you so much, Debbie. And it's such a joy to be here and such a joy to be in the book. And um, I've raised purebred dogs in addition to doing a lot of work with rescue dogs. And I'd say that the communication is really important um, for you with the dogs, but also for you with the owners. When you're looking for someone um, that is going to give the dog a forever home. And I can't stress enough how important I think the communication is to new owners about the responsibility factor that they are taking on a real responsibility. And I have never prettied up that picture for them. I think it's really important that they understand they're taking on a family member for life and sickness and in health. And uh, if they have small children, that the children go through extraordinary training, shall we say, before the puppy comes home so that they're aware of all of the dangers and they don't make any assumptions about what's going to be good or, or not so good for the puppy that they may not, they may not be aware of. So I think uh, it's real important from the standpoint of communication to me, to, to the owners and to everyone out there that's thinking about, about a dog to realize it's a super responsibility. And um, I know that when people would come to me and look at a dog and they would say, well, we're not sure if it's the right one. I said, well, then it isn't, you know, go find the right one. Because if it's the right one for you, you are going to know it. And it's, it's like a, a love affair, you know, it, it's something that you, you can't take lightly. So I think that for me, that's, that's a really important factor. Mm. And then the communication with the dogs, one of the important things that I've heard many dog trainers, and we have some excellent dog trainers here with us today, but a lot of dogs learning um, happens in the first 16 weeks. And after that, a lot of it is retraining. So when you get a puppy, it's really important to put a lot of time into them in communicating with them 
early on because some of the things that they learn in the very early stages are going to be life habits for them. And it's not that they can't be trained and retrained out of it, but it's so much easier to bring them up during that first precious time in a way where things are really solidified and, and with them, it'll stay that way. So. Yeah. Interesting. So much like a child's life, they say it, it really gets formed, the personality, the wounds, the gifts, all of that gets formed very early on. So it is with a puppy. And for folks who are thinking in their heart, gosh, I'd like a dog, uh, be aligned with your commitment. It is a lifelong commitment and, you know, and uh, it gives back. It's a 401k plan. That is for sure. Those were great <laughs> tips. Yeah. And so I want to bring on Susie Godsey, who I've seen work with her dog forever. And Susie, I'm, first of all, I'm so happy to have you here. I know you're in Germany. So thank you so much for being with us. And you've got some very interesting talents with dogs. Uh, could you speak to this? Because I would love your take. I'd love your point of view. <laughs> Well, thank you, first of all, for having me. And thank you for also being part of this really amazing book. And yeah, what what I really want to say is it's not just me who has this talent. Everybody does. And you were even saying it earlier, too. You just have to look at your dog and trust. And then you know what she desires and you can deliver. And to me, we all have that. We all have that connection. We talked about that. Um, it's just trusting yourself that you do have it and not thinking that, oh, this is just serendipitous or, oh, I'm crazy. No, what if you actually trusted that you can perceive the energy with which your dog is communicating? Because dogs communicate energetically as much as they do with their body language and noises, but also just energetically. And that's also how we communicate before we learn how to speak. So we all know this language. It's just a matter of practicing it again and trusting that you do know it. Mm. Yeah. Isn't that a big one in life? Like very interesting for those people who that's easy for to form those kind of connections. And for those people that it feels a little bit outside of, but what I hear you saying is it actually is innate. It's something organic to all of us to so it's funny because at the beginning of this, a lot of people are saying they were using the words flow and all of that. So I'm hearkening back to just having a flow with your dog and knowing that it's there. Yeah. And one thing I just want to add is in terms of communicating something also in training and everything, what if you started to look at what it is that you would like to have your dog do for you? Because a lot of times we communicate with the things we do not wish them to do which is, you know, don't bark. Well, what is that communication in actuality? You're saying bark because the word don't has really no relevance to your dog, but the word bark has a meaning. And so the dog goes, oh, you want me to bark more? Uh, no, actually, that's not what I'm asking for. Oh, wait, what do I have to say to get you to be calm, cool and collected and quiet? Oh yeah, I wish for you to be quiet oh, that makes more sense to the dog as well. So we need to also change the way we are communicating because of course we've learned a lot to say, well, I don't like this and I don't like that, but what is it that you actually would like from your animal? And so start looking at that. And I think you're going to see that your training is going to go much quicker. Mm, that's good. I'm going to use that. And I know that one, but you know what? In our household, we've got three dogs and they all think they're sentinels. So anytime the postman, anybody comes by, wah, 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 and it's, you know, it's hard when you're working at home as everybody is right now. So I'm going to start doing that instead of the alarms in my head going off, oh God, they're barking again to instead instill in them just this. Calm. I like the word you said, calm, cool, collective, quiet. Let's see. I'm going to report back to you, Susie, on that one. That's a good one. I'll implement. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Nancy Summers, you are somebody who worked with service dogs. They were very important in your life. I'd like to bring you on for your perspective about communication with a dog. What's essential? What works? Is Nancy Summers there? I know I saw her earlier. It's muted. Yes, sorry, I was muted. 
Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. This is amazing. And I love everybody that's here. Um, yes, I did not get my dog to be a service dog. It, it uh, happened through an experience that we went through. But interestingly, uh, being an author and focused on writing a book, but having to get through healing, I had to I always envisioned him and our story as a team because that's what I educate on with service dogs and advocate for military personnel and and you know people that that also have service dogs or want one or need one or just have an issue with a business um, with their service dog in terms of access. So he's retiring, and so now we're going through a whole new phase where. You, several of our wonderful trainers have mentioned not only the bond, but the training aspect and the trust. And I am finding myself, and it's just in the last week and a half, where I'm starting to sneak out because our connection is that he goes with me. And now all of a sudden, I can't take him everywhere for his own good. It's too much on him and his hips are giving way. And so my point to this is that I feel like I'm betraying the trust a little bit because, you know, I, he caught me sneaking in the other, sneaking back in the other day. And, you know, his, his expression said it all. I, I think when you mentioned communication, Susie, and the other, others have spoken about the connection and that these dogs know they're, there's an intrinsic knowing. And I think that that is what so many of us that do bond with animals feel and sense. And I think it's very fine tuned with service dogs. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, that's what I wanted to say. And, and then the last thing would be that I did envision him full, you know, coming full circle and him bridging my healing as I often help my clients understand that have a mental health issue that with a program, they can often graduate past a service dog if they choose to. And um, that was always my goal for myself. And so I thought my book would sort of culminate that. And yet I'm not sure that, that we're going to make it because that trajectory for me is a little slower. So this opportunity has allowed me to give a piece of our story. And I just really appreciate that. Oh, it's awesome. And folks who are listening or watching, just wait till you read the stories and uh, see what these people have created. Um, it's pretty special. I want to bring on someone I mentioned earlier, Hal Price, who has the most ridiculously adorable dog. So adorable that Riley, that's his name, the dog, has his own website, and rightfully so, social media, everybody's following him, The Adventures of Riley. <laughs> so Hal, welcome to the show. And can you mention, what is your chapter about in the ultimate book for dog lovers? Why was it important for you to be a part of this and to tell your story? Oh, uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be with you guys. It's been five wonderful years, Debbie, of knowing you, and uh, I love all the things that we're co-creating. It's been wonderful. I, um, the reason, what happened was during COVID, I had this little bear who's up here in the corner that nobody was getting hugs back in March, and we had a little thing in our neighborhood where they could put pictures of uh, bears in their window or write a little story, and we would have a drawing. I would give them a hug. They would get a bear at the end of the week. We'd, we'd have, get, give out about 15 bears every week on Sunday night. So the families walking through the park just to connect and to reconnect with each other. And I realized I wasn't connecting with me. And uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't had a dog for years and years. And I said, you know what? I need a hug back. <laughs> and we all need hugs. I think we're missing hugs more than anything else. So I just uh, went to a shelter and um, found this little little guy and what I wanted to do was I, I really write from the heart it's what all my books are about you know uh, the heroic heart and I wanted to tell his story so I actually turned journalist I went and interviewed everybody that had touched that puppy over the last uh I think he was born in December who had had a hand in that puppy's life and to tell his story from his perspective about he had a, he was born with a heart murmur 
you know, as, as God would have it. And I just knew that he had a special message to give to people by listening to his heart and healing the dogs next to him who were sad and how he put out a signal for me to come find him for me to get my hug. So um, he opened up my inner child and it helped my writing immensely to be able to connect and play again uh, at 65 years of age. And uh, I've never felt younger or more connected to me and to life. And this old dog brings out so much joy. And we found on 15 Halloween costumes last night. We found <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's perfect. I feel you. I hope you'll share. <laughs> okay. I can't wait to see the pictures. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you so much for being a part of the book. Um, Riley's story is moving. And so now I didn't realize he was so young. So that's cool. So now I know when I see, cause he's a little baby puppy. So he's, not, he's uh, five pounds, six ounces. He's not gonna get much bigger. He's not. I don't talk about his mom, but she knew a lot of dogs in her life. And uh, he's a Maltese Terrier poodle. So there's, he's got the best of everything. Get, give him a cuteness and a, a sassiness and smart. So uh, you can find him on the life of Riley. Oh, here's his, I drew this while we were talking. This is R-E-I-L-L-Y. It's probably backwards on your stuff, but that's his name is Riley, R-E-I-L-L-Y. His website is uh, rescueriley.com. Beautiful. Thank you, Hal. Ah, so cool. And uh, I'm going to bring Marnie on to the show, Dr. Marnie Hill. Fodorero. 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 Yes. Fodorero. It's so great to have you. And tell me, because I, I, I really, I was so grateful also for you to hear the call because I was so specific in my intention with this book that everybody come from a completely different point of view. I wanted as many different chapters uh, in this compilation and you absolutely fulfilled that. So tell us a little bit about what you wrote, why you wrote. Sure. Um, thank you also for having me here and letting me be a part of this wonderful endeavor. Um, my chapter is chapter five, and it's called Doggy Divorce. And it is like Hal's story with Riley. It is from the dog's perspective. And this particular dog named Bogey, not my dog, but I'm honored to tell Bogey's tale, um, is is finds himself in the middle of a pupternity and a mutternity suit. And um, so it's from a dog's perspective. There, there was a divorce in this family and there was parental alienation and some domestic violence as well. And so it was the dog's perspective when all of a sudden, you know, they had, this dog had the entire family, four children, two parents, ended up being split up. And so that from a dog's perspective, it's tough on kids when they are in this type of situation, but it's also tough on dogs. And to lighten the tone a little bit, uh, because it's a serious topic, and I wanted to bring awareness to that topic. Um, I, the whole book is written with puns, so play on words. And so it's, um, Hopefully it will be an enjoyable read, but also educational. Uh, but the, the message with this story, Doggy Divorce, is to handle life's challenges with love and compassion. So, you know, if you approach things with more of a spiritual slant on things, you will, you will find that goodness will prevail. I, I'm also an author like Hal. Um, I write more spiritual books. Um, my, uh, in my critically acclaimed, acclaimed book is God Came to My Garage Sale, which was endorsed by James Redfield, who wrote The Celestine Prophecy. So I have a lot of uh, spiritual folks that um, have endorsed me in this book. And, um, and basically, it's, it's uh, my message to the world is to look for signs and handle challenges with love and light. Oh my gosh, that's so nice. What a nice way, yeah, exactly, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's sort of perfect for the theme of our book, I think as well, for that kind of love and light mm -hmm. we're hoping to bring into the world. And uh, Judy, you have had some extraordinary dog experiences. I've had the good fortune of meeting your dog before he passed. So I'd like to bring you on to talk a little bit about 
why this book? Why did a dog book anthology call to you? And what was your chapter? Why was it meaningful? Okay, now don't make me cry, Tiffany. <laughs> oh, I'm hugging you. <laughs> Why it, it it came just uh, your invitation to join you came just a couple months after Simba had passed, and um, my chapter is called Two Bodies, One Beautiful Soul," and it's because <clears throat> it's because I had a golden lab at one time who was named Comet. And he was my first dog as an adult. And when he passed, I got the experience of, of actually talking to him after he had passed. And so it was like, this was the like hands on, there is life after the physical body goes, there is life. And he would talk to me and it was absolutely fantastic. And one of the things we decided that he would do is come back. And so we decided on the body of a West Highland Terrier. And uh, little Simba came back and um, we just had a marvelous life together. And uh, he, they both have been with me for my business. You know, I had a magazine publishing company and Comet was very prominent in that company. People loved him when he passed. People around the country were sending the magazine to their friends because I wrote a tribute to him. And then with Simba, he has been my co-host on Jazz Up Your Life with Judy, Step Into Greater Joy, Love and Abundance, which is my global chalice summit. So he, after he passed, shared with me how she had gotten from that, from evolving as a dog in his consciousness he said you know dogs also evolve and so he was so grateful that he got to have that experience to evolve as as a puppy in it as a dog consciousness and step into his dog power and that's what he's so excited about and now he plans to come back again we don't have the exact time but he is going to come back and we we are going to be doing a global animal summit and also a podcast on animals and so he was my co he's 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 a published author already he's already in another book <laughs> And, but for me, this is my first published book, but, and he is my co-author with this book too. And, and so um, I ask him, I say, you know, we're going on this show today. So what should I, you know, what's your message to people? He said, read the book. Oh, yay. (laughs) He's like, yeah, read the book. And, you know, it's because we've been talking about connection and communication that connection, I, you know, I see so many people on Facebook agonizing for years over the, the loss, mm. quote unquote, loss of their dog or their cat or some animal. They are so alive when they, their physical body goes. I know one lady wrote in, um, on Facebook and she said, Judy, how are you handling Simba's being gone. It's so difficult when the, our dogs die. And and there was just a split moment. It was like, oh, he, he's gone. And and yeah, it's he is gone, but he's so much around that those words that she used just really caught me off guard for a second because he is so very, very present in my life. And um, you know, he wrote the chapter with me so uh, it's it's just wonderful their dogs are so amazing they're just absolutely amazing they have so much to share with us yeah so much wisdom it's just incredible Mm. so thank you so you can see that's yet a completely other point of view and especially I really like that you bring in the part about beyond resilience but your knowingness that your relationship did not end. That's very powerful message because I think for all of us, we know that's the big issue, if you will. We fall madly in love. I don't know if there is any love such as what you have with your dog or perhaps for people, other animals, but it is probably the deepest love I may ever know. And so 
That's a concern for me, the day, because one day it's either going to be me or Shelby. One of us is going to go first. And I don't look forward to that, but I feel very inspired, Judy, by your point of view and by the skills you have to stay connected with Simbo, with Comet, and with whomever is to come next in whichever body. I think that's awesome. And I'm going to move on to uh, Liana. And Liana, welcome to the show. Uh, you actually work in a nature center, which is particularly very cool. You came to us via Hal. So I'm so grateful for all these threads, for all of you who wove each other into this project, the ultimate book for dog lovers. So I wanna bring Liana on and tell us, because you also have a really unique story, why this chapter, why was it meaningful for you to talk about a dog? Well, thank you so much, for De Debbie, for allowing me to be a part of this awesome endeavor. This is my first venture into publishing, so I'm super excited. Um, my, my chapter is really focused on the amount of emotional support a dog can provide um, in all different types of ways. And I mean, uh, our dogs really take on our emotions. So, you know, if you've ever had seen your dog um, staring back at you with concerned eyes. That is your dog connecting with you because they are feeling your emotion. So if you come home and you've had a heavy day um, and you sit on the couch, your dog senses that. So um, what my chapter is really focused on is I'm coming from a place where three years ago, I was, I was broken. I had lost my best friend in a tragic shooting. And she was not just my friend, she was also my roommate as well. So that made it even more catastrophic because I was used to seeing her every single day. So it completely changed the dynamic of my home. And the way I felt about my home was that it's my sanctuary because um, that's my place. My home is my place for respite. And it was just different with her no longer there. So at that time, my little Chewini, Roxy, who was seven, um, essentially became my therapist. She gave me so much emotional support that I really wasn't otherwise getting. I mean, I had people that were checking on me, but no one that was there with me when I got home. So Roxy just has this incredible intuitive nature and a strong ability to connect and be aware. And dogs are known to, to sense our emotions. In fact, they, like I said earlier, they take on our energy. Um, and so that's really what Roxy did for me. And what's more, when they, when a dog comes to you and they try to snuggle or place their head on your lap, they are giving you the emotional support that they're sensing you need. Um, so I think um, one of the things I've realized after writing this chapter is that more and more people, I'm, I'm more, more focused on, um, uh, or I should say I'm more hypersensitive toward when I see people that have a disability or somebody who has experienced a loss and I see them with a dog, I know that they are doing, they have exactly the same awareness that I do now that dogs can be wonderful emotional caretakers. Hmm. And just in general, therapy dogs can provide so much affection and support to people who have suffered loss. Yeah, that's so beautiful that an animal can be there to help heal a wound after a tragedy like you experienced and literally functionally help get you back on your feet. And I know we were all interviewed, all of us authors from the ultimate book for dog lovers, we were all interviewed previously a couple of weeks ago on another show. And I think it was Nancy Summers who said, it's very important not to judge somebody with a service dog because you don't know what the disability is. Like it could be something like, what Liana is talking about. And you may not see on the outside that she's dealing with a palpable tragedy. Uh, I've even heard, I remember where I used to work once um, HR stepped up because somebody made a complaint about um, some kind of service situation and HR, they put the kibosh on that right away and said, hey, you don't know if someone has cancer. You don't know what the backstory is like. Don't ever bring that up again. We know what's going on, end of story. So I think it's very important to see that these dogs are healers. Mm -hmm. And another piece I thought that was very important that Liana said is to understand too the influence we have on them. I've seen this firsthand. 
or my dog's gotten violently ill. The doctors find nothing wrong with her, but she doesn't stop. I'm like, oh, beginning of COVID that happened. She felt me a hundred percent. So I knew I've got to change what's going on inside of me right now. I've got to really get with it. Got to heal whatever this is, all of that done. I'm on track. And then of course she got better. So this is, you know, really great uh, information. I appreciate it so much. Let's see who we have not yet heard from of our gorgeous. Oh, Vicki, we heard from. Barbara. Um, and Barbara. Barbara is also coming to us from another country where I wouldn't mind being right now. Barbara, welcome to the show. First of all, you were one of the first authors who came aboard. You and Judy, boom, you were in. And so thank you for that. Thank you for your trust in me. And you and David Adelson, um, who's an awesome dude and has been on the show, you co-wrote this beautiful chapter. And I would love you to talk a little bit background about why you guys felt so compelled to tell the story you told. Well, Debbie, I really want to thank you for all you did to pull this together, because the minute I heard about this, that you were making this book, I was like, oh, my God, this is absolutely perfect. Because what David and I do is work with energy and the consciousness on the planet. And to me, dogs are the ultimate source of how we all can increase our consciousness on the planet. They are the way we open our hearts to unbounded love. And we've heard everybody talk about that so far, how it's helped them to feel more love for their dogs and how to feel and how to send love in an unbounded way. You know, Debbie, you said about how it may be the greatest love in your life. And it's true, they make it, we, we put qualities and limits on how we love others and how humans love others, but we put no limit on our love for our dogs and they put no limit on their love for us. And to me, that is how we raise the consciousness on the planet. And in particular, David did the research and all this study with all of his healing techniques and his quantum healing techniques that the dogs, that the rescue dogs in particular, to a fault, every one of them has some remaining residual trauma from that initial rescue. And that's what we delved into. And I talked about my own stories with rescue dogs and how I had one for many years and he just never got over it. Didn't matter how much training we had, he was still sad and just, just we just couldn't get over it. And I felt bad, like I wish I had known that this could have been healed energetically because we all loved him, he loved us, but he didn't like anybody else, I can tell you right now. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a challenge when we'd have play dates for the kids because he loved my kids, but not any other kids. So it was, um, I really wish I'd known that there could have been solutions energetically that would have helped him. And knowing that even dogs, rescue dogs that seem to be totally fine, have a heaviness and kind of a weight to them, their energetic level that it can be healed very easily. And so we delve into that energy and consciousness of the dogs. And so I'm really thrilled that you brought all this together and I'm honored to be with such amazing other authors in this book. So I really wanna thank you, Debbie, for all that you've done here. And what country are you coming to us from, Barbara? I'm in Australia, I'm on the island of Tasmania and we've been blissfully um, isolated. It's always been isolated. It's as far away as you can get from America, but it's, it's even far away for Australians. And we actually had, they've just opened up the borders again. We had locked out everyone off of the island for the last seven months. They just opened them up on Monday that the immigrants from the mainland Australia are, are allowed to come over. So we've had a blissful time, everyone really connecting more with nature and the animals. And it's been for most people here on the island a really, uh, a really magical time actually, mm. in spite of all the trauma and hearing the trauma elsewhere. Well, I'm so glad you're with us. I'm so glad that you felt compelled to join this. And I love the message you're giving that, you know, initially when you had a rescue dog, that sadness prevailed. There was no way to find a way out. And if only you had known then what you know now, of course, timing is perfect. 
but hindsight, right? Ah, energy, energy yeah. healing is actually very powerful. And, and I know you to be someone highly gifted. So I'm so grateful you are part of this book. I want to open this up to all the authors. So we're going to do what I call popcorn and folks can just chime in and give a couple of words, but I would love you to offer to the people watching or listening. And if you would like to watch this, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. And otherwise you are listening to this on podcast. Can you give us a ritual or a practice that you do with your dog or you've used that has created a sacred space, a sacred relationship with your pup? So no long stories. We don't have time for that. But if you could just throw out some information that can get people thinking or adding to the arsenal of what they already do or would like to do with their puppy or dog. And I open the floor to all of you. Well, I don't treat my dogs like they're just a dog. I treat them like they're a soul, a beautiful soul and nurture that. They love it. Debbie, I would say one thing I didn't mention and it is part of something that my life with my dog I've done is really pay attention to him and what he's doing and how he is paying attention to things in his world or just around us. And this would be true for so many people. And I know our dog trainers know that too, that uh, he particularly scents cancer, for instance, even though that is not what his purpose is. So if you pay attention, they can show us so much more. Whenever I meet a dog, I make a unspoken commitment to the dog that I'm going to help the dog um, by having the owners better understand them. Um, and it's just a way that I, for myself, to try to reach out to the dog, develop a trusting relationship and um, help the owners understand better. For me, um, Riley's opened up a new sense of exploration and discovery for me. We walk five miles every day. I usually take the lead, but there are times when I just let him take me where he needs me to go to see something that I wouldn't have seen had I not got off path, so. And I live in the Caribbean. And so I'm in touch with nature all the time. And so I go down to the ocean pretty much every day and I'm surrounded by um, so many animals, uh, so much wildlife and there are island dogs that are there. And so I connect with them just by looking at them in the eye and, and um, bringing them some nutritious food if they need it. And we always need to stay hydrated. So, you know, I make sure everyone has water, but uh, because I live in paradise, um, I think connecting with nature and um, connecting and, and seeing the animals that are connected with nature is a beautiful thing. I like to pull energy from the earth through the dog and then through me. And that might sound really strange, but give it a try and you might see something show up that you didn't expect. I would say for me, I, I think my, my two dogs have allowed me to sort of see through see things and experience things through their eyes, especially since I don't have kids. So um, when I take them to new places and see how excited they are and their reaction, especially the first time I took them to the beach, it was so much fun to see their excitement when they saw the waves or fear for that matter. <laughs> um, it allowed me to experience, you know, go back to my own childhood and remembering the first time I, I walked on the beach. When I'm teaching a new behavior, I see it in my mind first and I use creative visualization and, and then I feel it in my heart and soul and I send that to the animal. And then often the behavior happens without ever saying a word or without too much guidance. So essentially I use creative visualization and send messages to the dog intuitively. Well, we I'm actually gonna... use our dog. Good. All right, go ahead, Barbara. We actually use our dogs as part of the healing process here at the, where I live here in Tasmania on a meditation center because they sense innately when someone really needs something. So if the dog makes a beeline for one person in particular in the group, it means that person is going to need special attention from the dog as well as 
as other energy healing. And it's allowing the person to feel and receive that. So it's allowing yourself to receive more. I want to jump in here real quick and just say to Barbara's point, I had the good grace sometimes doing what I do for a living here on the podcast has like big swag benefits. And one of the benefits recently was that I got to go to a wolf wildlife reservation. And this is a man, a shaman who's dedicated his entire life to rescuing wolves. Like people will take in a wolf pup thinking it's a dog and it's like, oh, what, what's happening? This thing keeps growing and has very definitive behaviors that are not dog-like and that's true. So he rescues these wolves and it is an amazing experience. And to Barbara's point, what they do, part of what they do is re in rehabilitating the wolf is also rehabilitating people. So they will bring them together and the wolf always knows the child, the traumatized child who needs help or the abused child and the connection is always very sacred. It's perfect. So I love hearing same about dogs too. In talking about uh, rehabilitation, you'll read in the book how a dog taught me how to talk. Um, so I'll leave it, it there. Um, but the other thing I'd like to say is my dogs teach me so much. And one of the biggest besides love is um, being in the moment. You know, I view dogs as sort of being like true Buddhists. They don't regret the past. They're not planning out their future um, or worrying about the future, I should say. They're in the moment. And dogs help me to be in the moment with them as well as with other people and making connections. Has everybody had a chance? How about Vicki? Well, I was just going to say that I, all through all the years that I've had dogs and raised dogs, I always took time with the dog that was my special dog to, uh, to communicate with them. At like at the end of the day or whatever day, whatever time of day it was and be able to actually talk to the dog, but then stay and listen to the dog talking to me, even if it wasn't verbal. And it was truly an exchange that way when you're looking them in the eye and it was not a short exchange. It's usually at least five or 10 minutes or longer. And I still do that to this day. And it really draws you close to the, to your best friend. Mm, best friend indeed and paula i love saying that name so i'm gonna say it again paula yes. it's so exotic paula how about you <laughs> well i am more of that creepy person that would touch your dog when you're out on a walk and i'll go down to their level and touch their ears and you know sneakily look into their teeth and touch for bumps or lumps and Maybe the dog has a message for you that you haven't yet been aware of. Excellent. And so I'm going to end here once again for those listening who have enjoyed this. This is a quote from Groucho Marx. Outside of a dog, a book is a man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. <laughs> I recommend highly that you get the ultimate, M-U-T-T, -T, ultimate book for dog lovers. As you can tell from some of the stories that they are exceptional authors and exceptional, very unique stories that were told. I know that this makes an amazing holiday gift, an amazing gift for someone who loves dogs, anyone in the pet industry, the grooming industry, the dog service industry, the canine industry, the training industry, lovers, owners, all of the above, people who babysit, walk, any other ideas you guys have out there? Why do you think people should get the ultimate book for dog lovers? Because Simba said, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's a wise little pup, you know? <laughs> I, I would also say, because we have just faced the biggest challenges in our world, that we all need love and compassion in our lives. And we can get them from our furry friends and and so all of the authors and i've been 
very honored to be part of this book, but also really thoroughly enjoyed reading everyone's story. And there is such a message of love. And that is something that the world needs more of right now. Indeed. And so I highly recommend you get the book. Remember, it's on Amazon, the ultimate book for dog lovers. The URL is on the podcast site as well as on the YouTube site. I want to thank all the authors for their heartfelt contribution to this project, to this book, to this compilation, and that it's going out into the world to do and to create what it is meant to. Whether that means you give to a dog, whether that means that you donate to a dog organization or volunteer your time, and also know that 10% of the proceeds of the sales of this book are all going to cuddlycanines.com because of the amazing work they do on the planet. They rescue pregnant dogs who would have been euthanized with the pups inside of them and instead foster them to magnificent homes and everybody gets adopted. So this is going out to benefit the world of dogs because of all they've given us. This book is an homage from all of us to the dogs and to all of you. Subscribe to the show to hear the weekly number one transformation conversation. My upcoming guest next week is Ruben Langdon, the host of Gaia TV's interview with Extra Dimensional Show. He's an American actor and filmmaker seen in many films, including Steven Spielberg's and Peter Jackson's The Adventures of Tintin, and as Jake Sully and James Cameron's Avatar. His voiceover performances are heard in so many video games and anime titles, but he's mostly known as charismatic Ken Masters in the Street Fighter franchise and the gunslinging, sword swinging Dante in the Devil May Cry franchise. Wait till you hear this conversation. This dude is deep. I got to hang out with him recently in Arizona. And then we said, we got to do this. Time for you to come on the show and let's really deep dive into some major metaphysical stuff, as well as what's going on in the world of extraterrestrials and way more. I look forward to it. I hope you do too. Remember to write comments. I love hearing from you. And don't just dare to dream for you and your doggy. Dare to create all your dreams and your dog's dreams into reality.